So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's uh, really nice. Yeah, I actually um, wanted to introduce you uh, briefly and try that out. I, I was, I, I'm not wanting to. Uh, I'm not wanting to introduce people because I don't want, you know, your identity to be associated just with your work. Mm -hmm. But I also realize that it's helpful for people to know a little bit and get excited about hearing you mm -hmm. talk as well. So um, I just wanted to share um, that. Yeah. Like, would you like to just, just introduce yourself? Sure. Sure. Why not? I um, grew up in Southern California and I've been in working in professional sports for the last 17 years. Um, I was in New York City for a while working for a professional football league and about 10 years ago got this strong urge to move to India and um, help develop sport in this country with, mm. without having much experience living here or being really connected to Indian culture growing up in the States. Um, but I've been here in the last 10 years and been living in Bandra or Mumbai the last year and love this country, love who I get to be in this country and love the kind of exploration and growth and challenges that I experience over here. I also love getting to be part of something that means a lot to me, which is sport and helping more people get connected to that as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. So tell me more about like, I guess you're um, starting with, so you grew up in the US, right? And so what was the environment like when you were growing up? What was your childhood? What were the childhood experiences that shaped you? I lived in a in, in Orange. I grew up in Orange County, California, in Huntington Beach. It's mm -hmm. the OC, and um, and it, it was beautiful. I mean, it's an incredibly rich uh, county. Mm. Beautiful beaches. We have mountains nearby for snowboarding. We have vineyards around, and, and a very kind of like hunky dory, um, Pleasantville type of suburban life mm -hmm. that I grew up in, and with my. School was down the street, so I can walk there with my friends, played a lot of sports growing up. So in terms of kind of environment, it was fantastic. But then what I found is, and I, especially when I look back in my life, is that in those environments also, there was a lot of angst during mm. that period. And I'm sure everyone feels angst in different ways, but because when everything looks so beautiful on the outside, and on the inside, mm. there's a lot of discomfort. There was, um, you know, I was a proper, proper ABCD. Uh, right. And you know, my family... Uh, you know, while being first generation, uh, you know, over to the U.S. and grew up in villages in India. So mm. they're kind of trying pretty hard to figure out how to how to help my brother and I um, re retain our Indian roots and values mm. while having my grandparents live with us as well. But at the same time, allowing us to try to be American. And that created a lot of excitement, but also a lot of confusion mm. um, for us as well. And a lot of um, trying to figure out who, who we really are and who we want to be. Absolutely. So on one hand, it was one of the best childhoods you could possibly imagine because it was a beautiful place and my yeah. parents gave us everything you could possibly imagine. On the other hand, it was a lot of running away from who we were. Both my mm. brother and I experienced it in different ways. And now we can discuss it maturely. Tell me openly. more about that. How were you running away from who you were? I mean, I'll never forget that, um, you know, it, it happened early on in my <coughs> life and it's a story that kind of, comes back to me now when I think of my early days is, um, you know, uh, I was playing playing a lot of soccer when I was really young. And I remember um, a time where we were at school and these kids were, were picking teams and, you know, and they were going one by one, um, picking who's, and I, I was clearly one of the best, even at the age of four or five, I knew I was good and everyone knew I was good. Right. But I was not only the last one picked, I was, I was not picked. And the yeah. reason I was not picked didn't was at the time the captain had said, look, your your skin color is like poo. Oh, wow. You smell like you smell like poo, you're, you're you don't want to we don't we don't want you and because he said that the other captain didn't. And this actually molded a lot of my next many, many years of my yeah. life because at that time I had just this just made this decision that if I'm white, if I was like them, they would let me play soccer and, yeah. and by that that meant that I could do anything I wanted. There'll be more opportunities in life. So I think at the age of four, I just decided that I'll become white. It meant meaning that I never really hung out with many Indians. I mm -hmm. um, didn't like Indian food. I didn't really resonate or um, really absorb or get excited about Indian culture. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to disown that part of you very much. I didn't even yeah. invite a lot of friends home um, because it, Did you know, my, want like, my grandparents were there. Yeah. There was puja rooms around. There was all this. So it's it's embarrassing now talking about this. Um, but I looked at the age of four to probably 27 and it was completely running away from being Indian. Absolutely. 
Wow. So then what was the angst around doing that? Like, what, how, how is it to live like that for you? So you always justify and you validate mm-hmm. everything. So when I would, there was only a couple Indians at my elementary school or middle school or even high school. So you look at them and you look at them and you realize that, well, you try to say, well, they're kind of nerdy, like they're them. different, they're introverted, their parents don't let them play sports. So it's so good that I'm not like them, that I'm, I'm more popular, more cool. I'm playing on the, the football team at my school and right. I'm hanging out at the cool parties. I'm getting invited to go to the beach <coughs> bonfires. I'm going to all the cool, coolest events. And, and I, every time I was invited somewhere, every time I did something well, you know, good in sports or every time yeah. anybody even kind of acted like I was one of them in terms of like the white or right. non-Indian community. I always just just validated whatever decision I've made or whatever path I'm on was was a good was the right path. Absolutely. And any time I was at family gatherings or cultural events, I would kind of I would hang out with everyone because of like it's our kind of community. But at the same time, I always differentiated myself from every one of them, including my brother at times as well, because I yeah. just felt that I was different than any, anybody. Mm. And so I didn't know any other way because at that time it was being validated over and over again by every experience I was having. Every time I was invited to any camping trip with my friends or going on soccer tournaments to Europe, I would just look back and say, well, those Indian cut family friends are not getting that. So thank Absolutely. God I, I did, I've made the choices that I made. So you uh, continue to validate those choices through the experiences you were having. Every day. And how did that affect your relationship with your family then? Because that was the part of you you were trying to disown in a way. So my my parents were pretty cool about everything because they also were really happy that we could have the kind of experiences that we're having and yeah. they wished for those experiences to happen for when they moved to America and were thinking about having children. They would only hope that we would assimilate. get these very yeah, assimilate and not go through the same challenges that they went through when they moved yeah. to, to the U.S. and had to kind of figure out how to become American in some way. Yeah. However, at the same time, um, and I think it was worse for my brother than I is when we were running away from Garbas or running away from Diwali events or running away from mm-hmm. Holi events or not really, you know, we weren't speaking Gujarati at home and yeah. Gujarati was being spoken at home. We weren't watching Bollywood films and other people had booked. We didn't have any other Indian friends. So yeah. I think in some respects, when it came to the community, we were the outcasts, even though my mother and father were an amazing glue that kept the community together. We were their kids who were just my brother and I were clearly not that. And there was a point where my brother started getting piercings all over his uh, ears, his tongue. He had different colored hair at times. And I I even started getting embarrassed for him because then I was knowing right. that the community, the Indian community were talking about right. us and talking about him. So I think I was playing both sides. On one hand, I was running away from and, and acting like I don't care. Yeah. On the other hand, I really did care what they thought about us. And I Absolutely. cared about it. And, and I, I noticed it most because my, when my brother rebelled a lot is when I actually started um, started cu- coming back a little bit more. Trying to bridge that, that gap. Yeah, and making like, sure my parents felt like at least one of their two kids <laughs> is not being um, discussed by the, by the yeah. community around us, which is very important to the perception of the community in terms of that was important to them. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, that, you know, by result, it was important to me as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think that's the experience of so many of us, like actions that are governed by how people perceive us. So mm-hmm. like, you know, your experiences with your classmates and how you acted with them and then with your community. And, yeah. And like, what about your relationship with your, like, how did you see yourself at that time? Was there a conflict with that? Or- I, I think so. And um, the, again, looking back, you... When, you know, when I think back on my childhood, I think back at how fortunate I was, how much mm-hmm. my parents gave me, how much um, access and opportunity I had in life to experience so many things that a lot of people didn't get to experience, especially when I go to my mother and father's villages now in Gujarat, and I think about where they were and mm-hmm. where they came and, and how much they gave my, Paris and I mm-hmm. is special. However, I remember a lot of times, and I used to journal a lot growing up, and so I look back at my journals and... You know, when I was really being true and honest with myself, mostly I would write about how I'm not feeling like I'm accepted. I'm not feeling good. And and while everything around me was beautiful, I'll, yeah. I'll never forget being on this cliff in uh, my university is UC Santa Barbara, another really um, American <laughs> university. Not a lot of Indians were there. Yeah. And uh, having 
everything one could ever imagine. You know, I was graduating college, university soon. I had all these friends. I had all these great experiences. Um, I was going to um, get my MBA in the East Coast, and I was sitting on this cliff, and I was just feeling terrible and yeah. feeling and not knowing why I'm feeling terrible, terrible. And I wrote in my journal about this and I think there was something there that I don't think I was ever really going to be happy if I didn't own who I was. Yeah. And it only yeah. came later in life, which I'm sure I'll share about, but it was during those first probably 20 something years of my life. Um, I never, I, I was just running away from who I was. So there were yeah. really temporary uh, moments of happiness, but not that inner comfort of owning of just yourself. being yourself yeah. and being at ease because you're constantly aware of how you're being perceived and responding to that absolutely yeah it was a lot of that and i, I guess when you're younger it's hard to identify what that is of course. you just yeah, feel like oh, this is teen, teenage angst or this is just i don't know a hangover that's lasting too long or something like that but yeah. then when you really look into it you think ah, how could I be surrounded by beauty in, in, in around me with family, with friends, with uh, even the aesthetic beauty of the place that I'm living yeah. and I have money, I have support, I have everything and I'm still not happy. So and I really off. sense like this loneliness in that, you yeah. know, it's like it, not being seen and understood for who you are. And oh yeah. Actually, I found myself, Although I was surrounded by party people, I always found, I would always in any party or in any social circle find the person who wants to have a deep conversation mm -hmm. and then just l slowly kind of maneuver myself with that person out of the conversation. It could be a guy, it could be a girl, it could be yeah. a dog for all that matters. But <laughs> so, somebody that wants to just talk to me about just share and connect. Yeah. And I remember people used to think that's cheesy because they're like, don't you want to be the crazy party person that's yeah. here? And I did like that at times because in that space, I got to feel uh, accepted. Yes. But you like the attention of that space. Yeah, the attention. Exactly. And, and just knowing that, okay, I'm identified as one of them, as, yes. as somebody who can be cool in this space. But the reality was I just wanted to be with people mm -hmm. who I can just talk to and share and be open with and connect with. And I wanted that even at a very young age. And Absolutely. as I've grown older, I've understood that is just something that allows me to feel much more at ease with myself as right. I can find somebody else I can connect with. And so then um, as you grew older, mm -hmm. you know, how did all of this shape the decisions you took and like the direction your life took after that? So one of the things that I've understood was, um, and these are after a lot of self-reflection that this came up, was that because I had this belief that because of my skin color um, was meant that I'm inferior and mm -hmm. this came from that early age incidents that yeah. I felt that I was already walking in with a negative sign. So then yeah. I had to do that much more to Absolutely. be um, accepted. And You're not never even good enough, right? So, yeah, yeah, I was never going to have, and if I'm going to walk into a room or if I'm going to walk into a conversation or a group, I, I, I need something more than just my, 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 myself. However you are. Yeah, yeah. however I am, because yeah. I got to step up. And yeah. that was something that was felt like it was drilled into me when I was younger. And so... Yeah. What I did was I made sure I got the coolest job or a cool job that was something I was I was passionate about, of course, and something that I wanted to do. I wanted to work in sports, mm. and I was pretty clear about that. But I also <coughs> wanted to always have a cool story and a cool mm. job because it at least gave me something to talk about, something yeah. something interesting about yeah. me that makes me at least unique. Stand out. Stand yeah. out, yeah. Some of people say, hey, that, that's that guy, Neil, he's... He's doing that yeah. instead of, oh, that's just that Indian guy, Neil. So I ended up pursuing my, my passion, which was getting a job in soccer and ultimately did that. So it it drove a lot of that. Now, whether something positive came out of it because I got my dream job, I'm very happy. But yes, in spite of that, there were still bouts of, of loneliness, even in New York City, working in my dream job. Um, mm. And it, 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 it continued throughout my 20s, I'd say, where... Mm. While I, I kept achieving everything I ever wanted. So in anything I set my mind to, I would always achieve, no matter right. what it is. I achieved my biggest goal at that time, which was to, to get a job with Major League Soccer and live in New York City. But at the same time, yes, during many years in New York City, I would look around from my rooftop of my apartment and say, look at all the buildings, look at yeah. the Brooklyn Bridge and say, you know what? I don't know what it is. I'm still not okay. And mm. um, I think that's what led to later uh, choices in my life. What do you think was life. missing? I, I think it was a lot of the same thing is that I, most of my decisions are being driven by this need to be accepted or this need to feel whole and complete rather mm -hmm. than it just being me. 
Yeah. And I think what was missing and what was exhausting about that was just that it, nothing was fully natural during yeah. those years. Nothing was truly authentically me. It was this four-year-old boy trying to figure out how he can be accepted by other people, how he can be interesting, how he could be cool, how yeah. his parents could think it's cool, but at the same time, how the Gujarati community can think yeah. he's okay as well. Yeah. So I was constantly trying to please a lot of people, so I thinking that that would please me, but nothing. I mean, it's just running around. It's like you're framed by all your achievements. You yeah. Know? It's like that's your frame. You're surrounded by your achievements and they're your, you know, and sometimes you just want to step outside of that frame and say, you know, that's not all that defines you completely completely i think at around the same time my brother wasn't doing so great in his his education other so it just <laughs> gave me more impetus to try my best to achieve more to right. do more interesting things to be around more cool to have more cool stories to tell when i go back to california with the, with the aunties and uncles around and yeah. all of that i was doing for me and my own reputation my own perception my own acceptance but at the same time i was trying to do that for to make up for what my brother wasn't providing It's like a compens well. compensating action constantly. It's like, oh, you know, he's, even earlier on when he, you said he had all these, um, you know, piercings and stuff, you were compensating for him by, yeah. by, by showing up even, you know, more like the ideal, you know, boy and son. 100%. And, yeah. I think that drove pretty much my first, yeah, 25, 26 years of my life. That must have taken such a toll. It did because it, it didn't, uh, on paper, I looked like I had the most perfect life ever. You know, I, I achieved certain things that I um, very quickly in my life that a lot of people dream to achieve. And I had lived, I was living in this great city that I always wanted to live in. I had these great group of friends. So same thing is that everything around me was seemingly pretty cool. And I had an amazing set of parents who were there to support. But still, um, I found myself turning to alcohol and, and needing those times to just let loose and party all weekend yeah. from Friday night to Sunday nights just to feel um, like like I can stop my mind from, like almost numb my mind from all the kind of thoughts that I was having all yeah. the time. So, Or just to feel like I can actually celebrate my achievements instead of just constantly thinking about what's the next achievement. So yeah. it is exhausting and it was exhausting. And it was also a lot of fun at times as well because a Absolutely. lot of crazy times, a lot of travel, a lot of wild um, experiences with all the colleagues and running around and all the people that I've met. But I don't think yeah. it was sustained ever at one point sustained yeah. contentment, sustained bliss, sustained any real happiness. Absolutely. And it's like this picture perfect on the outside again. Yeah. And it's like we don't, you know, uh, we're never aware of what's happening inside of people when they're living that, you know, very glorious uh, life on the outside and going to parties and having all these friends and New York City. And mm. yeah. So then what was this? What what shifted uh, what was the trigger that led you to shift out of that or away from that? So, interestingly enough, it was landmark education. Mm -hmm. I was a it was a self it was a leadership program that I, I a friend of mine who was a roommate um, was involved in, and she's just um, you know she was she was uh, part of one coaching she was coaching or assisting in some yeah. uh, one of the events, and she just invited me to go to this guest event. Now. Um, it's not really like a promotion for landmark, but more that in that space of three, I, I ended up registering for the, the forum and in three yeah. days of, of being there, you know, one of the things that I got in going back, I, I was able to identify that four year old story where I mm. was, you know, not picked on the team. And I think in that space, you know, what was incredible is I, I was able to see clearly how exhausting and how tiring, how much I've been running away from being Indian. Yeah. And I never really saw it until then. I was, then you actually go back in time and you look at, all my friends were, I had to make sure that they were, you know, not in, not in um, it, yeah. all of my, um, anything I did even socially or, or professionally, I wanted to try to do things that weren't traditionally what the Gujarati community in California yeah. were doing. Um, and the weirdest thing about it was I was looking back and I literally thought I was better than all Indians, even though yeah. I wasn't. And, yeah. and then I would walk into certain Indian parties thinking that, they're going to treat me different. Yeah. And when they didn't, I was confused. And it was to the point where I yeah. had make myself believe that I'm better than a lot of the Indian community, which is such crap. Yeah. Because I went back and none of it is true. Yeah. So what what changed was that I actually understood that that was, one, that I was um, running away from being Indian. Two is that I understood that I've been trying to overcompensate, not overcompensate, compensate for my brother mm. um, and some of the challenges he's had in his life. 
and some of the challenges he's created for my my family for a very long time. And mm. so because of that, I I had not I had lost sight of who I was, and I was just mm. as I said earlier, being driven by somebody who wasn't me. Yeah. So in in discovering that, and when that insight comes up. Um, one of the things that you do in that program is you you act on those insights quickly before they just go back into yeah. to yourself. And so one of the first things I did is I just booked a ticket to India. I mm. realized that I've been running away from being Indian for twenty seven or twenty three years at the time. I was twenty seven. I uh, I decided I, you know the fact that I've never been to India. Wow. I just so I just went online and on one evening after the course and I just booked a ticket for my my Christmas holiday, which was coming up a few months later. The second thing I did was I called my brother up and I, I apologized. I apologized for trying to make him me and I apologized for never really accepting him for the way he is. Yeah. I apologized to my parents for actually um, only hearing positive out of my mouth, never getting the real story yeah. for so many years, only hearing, oh yeah, everything's great, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, never saying, hey, you know what, I'm... I'm I'm not feeling so good right now, yeah. or you know that, that meeting didn't really with them. go that well. So, yeah. so de developing a relationship that's just basically me spouting out positives and Absolutely. never really giving them their son. And so, in, in that those conversations with my mother, my father, and my brother, a lot of new ways of looking at myself and looking at life opened up, mm. and it was pretty pretty impactful um, since then. How did how what changed about how you saw yourself? What changed mainly was I was able to assess. You know, when I'm being me and when I'm being that version of me that right. I want other people right. to, to know. So well, one of the, the biggest thing I would say was that um, when I would speak to my brother, for example, I would make sure that I, I spoke to him in a way that was like a friend and mm. not some person who wants to turn him into me. Right. And I think that th that started changing. When I started speaking to my parents, I started noticing when I'm being honest with them and when I'm just being this... Projecting. Th projecting. Yeah. And then... What was amazing is that India started coming to my life in a major way. So all mm -hmm. of a sudden, an Indian girl came into my life mm -hmm. who I started dating. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I started liking Indian food slightly, you know, more to more than I, I, I did before. <laughs> all of a sudden, um, I couldn't wait for this trip to India, which in the past, if I had a free couple of weeks to go travel somewhere, I would have definitely gone to Europe or South America yeah. or anywhere else. But now I was thinking of all the different things I can do in India. I, I found myself... Um, Realizing that, you know, I wanted to go com uh, volunteer in, in communities of Indians in America and help those kids understand that you can actually work in a career of your dreams instead of yeah. being an engineer or a doctor like a lot of a lot of Indian parents were pushing their kids in. Yeah. So I, start, I started attending those. I ended up joining this network of Indian professionals. I was modeling Indian uh, clothes uh, <laughs> for some brand for a while. It was like it wasn't like a 180 flip, even though it sounds like it's a 180 flip of this guy who was super white turning Indian. But the reality <laughs> was, is like I was finding more and more ways. It was actually like I opened up and it all started pouring into me. Yeah. So all of a sudden, all these new things that never showed up in my space before started coming in, and a lot of it had to do with being co connected to um, this beautiful culture that I've been running away from for mm. so long. What was that like for you? What did it change inside? It was exciting because it was like this new world that never existed before right. was starting to show up. It's like uh, up until that point, my whole world was hanging out with friends, you know, doing great at my job, and, which is promoting soccer in America, and getting hot girls to hang out with and date right. and, you yeah. know, whatever, and, and travel on the side and whatever yeah. I could. And that was my life. And, and at the same time, making sure my parents knew that I was okay in life. And checking in on my brother every once in a while. Yeah. Literally, that was my whole world. Absolutely. There was no spirituality. There was no self development or growth. There was no, there's nothing beyond those four or five key things. And I didn't know any life beyond that. I was just going to keep going up. But all of a sudden, when this new world of India showed up in my life, that I'm like, holy crap, I'm Indian, and and I'm so excited to explore what it is to be Indian, what it is to 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 understand this culture more understand mm. this country more i mean because of travel was so important in my life so because sports i kept researching indian football all the time mm. i was learning about cricket i was learning about a lot of things that had to do with this country and the culture of this country and the sporting culture of this country that never existed before and in my my my, my frame of thinking in, in any way so it was um yeah it was like discovering a new book or a new sounds series like you're such or an adventure else. you know it yeah. sounds like you just discovered this whole new thing that is so fascinating and exciting to you and you just got to like jump in being like, oh, I actually like this stuff. I don't 
need yeah. to like disown it. It's it's actually right there. It's part of me. Yeah, and I found that it actually was interesting. Now I think back of it, it actually gave me my uniqueness because at mm-hmm. that point, yes, I'm 27 years old. I work in professional soccer. I'm this guy living in New York with eight million other people living in New York, whatever it might be. But I'm. I'm no longer that much. When you're in New York City, you're not the unique. Everyone's unique. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this um, kind of connect with India started coming into my life. I was planning my trip to uh, to the country a couple of months later. I found that that was actually the thing I was trying to be unique by being running away from India. I was being trying to be unique because I didn't want to be considered just an Indian guy living in America. I was finding being more connected to India was actually making me more unique, and it was actually more naturally unique as well because yeah. it's more. Who I really it's am. It's just being yourself then. Yeah, being curious, being fun-loving, being excited about learning about this culture that is so close to home but so far away at the same time. All of that was so exciting. It sounds like, you know, the image in my mind is like you're sort of letting go of the control of like your image and, mm. you know, you're just starting to experience life more fully by just doing whatever you yeah, feel called to do. absolutely right. So it was a lot of letting go and a lot of just... just Opening new chapters that are new pages or new new going to new sections of the library that I just would never have gone in and, and that I never let myself or felt like I mm-hmm. needed to and now I'm discovering it kind of a whole new space which was cool. Yeah. So then, what was it like once you got here and like what were the challenges? What were the you know the key things that were shaping you when you when you got here? Gosh, everything was a challenge. <laughs> was like, and that, so imagine that you know. Being being somebody who felt like that point has got like pretty figured out in terms of at least what I've achieved and what I'm doing in New York and in New York City and in Major League Soccer was my dream. When I got here, I was alone and um, I found myself struggling to do anything. Like I couldn't, I didn't have a phone, I didn't have a SIM card, I mean I had a phone that worked in India. I had a couple of friends that I had connected with, or family that I'd connected with, and some people who were connecting me with other people. But the whole three weeks was one big realization that I don't know anything. Like, yeah. I thought I knew everything. I thought I had this thing figured out, this life figured out. And then I got here, and everything that I thought I knew, I, I realized I didn't really know. Mm. And I'll give you an example. Like, one, one of the things that was really eye-opening to me was when I went to my father's village and I went there it's a small 150 cow dung home type village and mm. it's about an hour away from Baroda mm. and my foy had taken me there and um there's this really in- funny incident that we're in this um the old home where they grew up in the 1940s or eight uh, my um eight mamus and mommies and everyone who was kind of part of my my dad's uh, sibling clan which about eight of them they had all moved to the U.S. and we've kind of all grown up together and I saw where they grew up in, in this tiny, tiny home. And at the same, what was happening was that um, we were just visiting and there was some other family living there, but we explained who I was. And in my mind, I'm thinking it's like this Bollywood movie scene. Here is mm. this hero coming in, mm. coming from New York, um, visiting this family. They're all sleeping on these charpoys, about 10 of them. And they're offering me tea and cha- or chai and, and biscuits. And I'm thinking, what can I do for them? And in my mind, I'm like, how could I help this family? Because it would be really nice for me to kind of fulfill, fill, uh, close the cycle, or, or you know, for, or pay it forward. And whatever I, money or whatever footballs that I had carried with me, I can give to them. Yeah. And what had happened was that in Gujarati, they started talking to my foy, and and, and and then they started asking some questions about me. And they said, where, um, where do you live? I said, New York. And they said, um, okay, where do your parents live? I said, they said, oh, they said, do you live with their parents? I said, no, they, they live in California. Oh, how far is California from New York? I said, six hours. Oh, by car? No, no, by flight. I said, okay, but you live with your wife? I'm not married. Said, who, who cooks food for you? And uh, I said, no, no, I eat outside typically. And you can see their, their, their grins kind of going well, down and they're feeling yeah. like a little bit, and you can see it kind of got weird in the room. And then they said, well, how often do you see your parents? I said, oh, once every few months. And then they finally again went to start whispering to my boy. And they said, and she just started bursting out laughing. And they asked, I said, what, what boy? They said, oh, they want to know if you want to move in with them. I said, why? <laughs> they said, well, this poor boy, he, he doesn't have family. He doesn't have a wife. Relationship. No, his parents are far away from him. He's, he's eating outside food every day. They said, we can make room for him here. Just let him stay in this country with us in this village. And I realized 
Here, I thought I made it because I've lived so far away from my parents. I'm, I'm a self-made man at this point. I'm living, um, I'm making decent money. And I can travel the world and do this. And these people are saying, poor guy, he has no family. He's eating food he's outside all the time. He's to... not connected to anything. And he's he's alone. He's a loner. Yeah. Well, we're all together. We have a little bit of space in this room for him. He can just live with us. And at that oh, point, wow. I left that village thinking, I, I came all the way to this village to, to learn this lesson that, Whatever I think of success, whatever I feel like I've achieved, you know, and I'm a successful man, and it's, it's, success is so relative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I need to discover a lot more about myself and about life to ever call, call myself a success. Wow. That's so beautiful because they're talking about just the relationships mattering so much more than achievement. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and you talked about this idea of like being seen as a loner, or like, and it made me think about, What's that been like? Like, what's been your relationship with being on your own and and seeking connection and love? Mm -hmm. And like, would you be willing to talk, explore that? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, when I was eighteen, I, I moved out of home, like many of us do, and and then I, I I'm thirty nine now, so I've been living away from home the last uh, you know eighteen plus years, and I feel that. Uh, so I think I, you know, living alone, I've always lived in these kind of studio apartments in New York. And even when I moved to India, most, mm. mostly was in these tiny apartments. And I, I found myself rarely at home alone. I, I, I would always be outside with people or yeah. at work or traveling or anything. So I kind of masked or ran away from actually being alone yeah. and having to experience that sense of aloneness. That sense yeah. of aloneness. And I would yeah be the type of person that on a Saturday morning I'd call my friends and just make a plan with them oh, yeah. and make sure that I always had somebody around, but I never wanted to live with people. I always wanted my space as well. So it was kind of, um, kind of like that. What's changed over the years for me is that I found through, through spiritual practices and especially through meditation and through retreats, I've found that being alone is a beautiful thing. So, mm -hmm. um, I think the, the scariest times for me were times where I would be feeling dark right. and, and I would be alone and I had no one to connect with. And yeah. it was almost like I didn't I didn't know who to turn to. I didn't know what to do. And I was questioning every decision I've ever made in my life. And those are the yeah. darkest, darkest times, especially with jet lag, coming back from the U.S. to India, three, four nights in a row. You'd just be sitting there at three in the morning in this windowless or tiny studio. This and, is in and, India, once and, you had moved to India. Yeah, and I'd be in Gurgaon. Because what happened in New York, I always had friends around. So yeah. even I'd have roommates or I'd have people around, or even though I was living on my own space, there'd be people around. So I didn't have to actually experience being alone very often in New York, even though I was on my own, essentially. I wasn't married or wasn't living in with a, any, any partner. Oh, no, yeah. But I always had people around that I can turn to at any time and they'd come meet me. And when I moved to India... For so I was alone for many many years in terms of I was not living with um, with anybody and I there was a and you know access was harder because I I didn't I don't didn't drive yeah. I had a driver but I was just you You're know not I, as I, mobile. yeah I was in in Gurgaon was not the most charming of places to live at the time and um, and so I the hardest times were when I would come back from the U S after three weeks of traveling around being with friends and family and then I'd be jet lagged and I would not be sleeping and it'd be three or four in the morning. I know I have work the next day and I'm just dreading every minute actually. Like nothing feels good. And it's actually at those moments when I saw my, my true loneliness, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And, and it's at those times that I, the, the scariest thing is when I question everything. I question leaving my family so many yeah. years ago. I question uh, moving to New York. I question, definitely question moving to India, even though I was, yeah. Achieving a lot in terms of social success, spiritual success, yeah. um, definitely professional success. But, but I was like, feel, what's the point? Yeah, what was the point? If you feel like terrible, you feel yeah. this bad. And I think if it wasn't for finding certain masters that come in my life, Osho came into my life around that time. I think I needed to hit those lows to find some of the gurus and spiritual masters and just practices. Otherwise, were you I would seeking always, them out? I. I wasn't seeking them out. Um, what had happened was when I moved to India in 2009, I was in a relationship and I um, 
with somebody I'd met in New York, mm. and she was also Indian, but grew up in the States as well. We mm. both had this dream that we were going to move to India together, mm -hmm. and, and she would do de she was involved in development work, and I was involved in sports. And when I moved, she moved about six, six months later. And there was um, a period of a few months where everything, again, on paper seemed perfect. Here we are living in India. We both have pretty good jobs. We had good money because she was still getting her American salary. We had, um, you know, we had some friends that we were making and life just generally seemed good on paper. And then uh, my health started going bad from kind of the move to India and uh, the food wasn't really suiting me. Our relationship was, we had brought a lot of baggage from New York thinking that yeah. it would just go away when we were in India. Yeah. It just got worse because now we're on our own in, New York, in India yeah. and there's a struggle for us to yeah. kind of settle in. And a lot of other things were unraveling. And, and what ended up happening is she I was in the hospital basically for three weeks because of a, yeah. a botched colonoscopy while I was trying to figure out why my stomach was, was, was the way it was. And she, um, in that time, we also recognized this relationship is not working. And ultimately, she moved back to the U.S. And my job was really taking a toll, my, my, my professional status, because I was in the hospital for so long and I really wasn't connecting and resonating with the first company that brought me over here. And I remember getting out of the hospital and uh, my partner had already gone back, my girlfriend at the time, and my, my, my clients were kind of moving away from me at the time. Um, a lot of the money that I had saved was just gone into the hospital bills right. to, to, to take care of me. And I, I looked at my life and I said, well, you know, when I moved to India, I was in my mind, I was coming with this girl that I was going to marry. I, I was going to, you know, going to make lots of money and I was, I had good savings. Um, I was going to have a lot of friends and I you know, thought about all these things that, and professionally I was just going to be great. And then I looked at my life and I looked at myself alone in this big apartment that I can no longer afford. I'm like, I have no girlfriend. My health is terrible. I can barely walk yeah. because my, I was just in the hospital for so long. Most of my savings went to my um, medical bills. My professional life is in a mess. And I don't even know what I'm going to do next. And my family is begging me to come back to the U.S. and saying, okay, you tried it. It didn't work out. Yeah. And no one is very... Um, you know, uh, envious of my life in any way right now. And I think that's when I hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And it was at that time that all these new things started coming into my life. Um, a, a, amazingly, a yoga teacher rang the doorbell randomly and he asked if I wanted to do yoga. And I said, yeah. And he said, I can yeah. only do 4.30 4 a.m. slots. I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't think I've ever woken up at 4.30 a.m. in my life. And I started doing yoga at 4.30 a.m. with him. And I, somebody gave me the Gita and I started reading it. Then I signed up for a marathon three months later, even though I was just recovering from my injury, and I ran this half marathon. Then magically, I opened up the Times of India, and in the help section, it said, um, I was reading a Rumi book that somebody had given me, and it said, um, Sufi workshop. And I was like, and said, they'll talk about Rumi and this and that. And I said, I want to go. And I ended up at this place called Zorba the Buddha, which opened up my life to meeting Osho, you know, bringing in Osho's philosophy in my life, just meditation, yoga, tantra. So... All these beautiful things started coming into my life when I hit rock bottom. And but something was motivating you to pick those things up too, right? Oh yeah, I mean, it was, but it was, it was that realization that everything that I was ever wanting, um, I, I got it at one point, and now I've lost it all. And yeah. I didn't want to just go back and try to get the girl again, try to yeah. get the job again, try to get. There had to be something else, and that's when yeah. yoga, meditation. So I was open to to something new. Yeah. And that's when they started coming into my life, I would say. Right. Wow. That yeah. must have been another shift altogether. Oh, completely. And that, I think that adventure was more exciting because that's a really beautiful unknown adventure. It's like mm -hmm. one is going into some crazy wild party and taking some drugs and seeing where that takes you. That's one adventure. But this was more like this world of meditation, this world of heart opening, this world mm -hmm. of chakras, this world of... Uh, connecting with people from a completely different space, this mm. world of sustained happiness, um, this world of going to the Himalayas to random retreats and wondering, what are you doing there? You're wearing a robe and you're, you're <laughs> meditating at like sunrise with all these people and, you know, taking sannyas at some random place. And it's so odd, but somehow, and I, and I, you know, I, the times I'd look at myself with these malas and, 
robes and thinking, who is this guy? What, <laughs> like this guy, this person who was just a year ago living in Manhattan, having the time of his life at these rooftop parties, is now sitting in, in the Himalayas, you know, wearing a mala and meditating and chanting Om. And I'm like, this is such a silly, like this is a, such a, like a, a movie scene or this is such a, like a cliche of, you know, the monk who sold his Ferrari. But then you're there doing it and it feels right. And you're like, here I am. Okay. That's so interesting because it's, you know how we're saying you were letting go when mm -hmm. you started coming to India. And it's like, this sounds like an extension of the more you let go, you started flowing with whatever started coming your way oh, instead yeah. of, it doesn't sound like you chose those so rigidly. Like, no, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. No. It sounded like you were just like, what do I have to lose? I'm just... I'm just going to go with whatever comes my way and sounds, uh, you know, something resonates with that. Yeah, you're completely right. It was um, a beautiful flow. And yeah. nothing um, that happened after that, kind of the first time of feeling really dark um, after everything had ended, nothing was planned after that. Everything was, you know, I, I, would, I, would, see, I would see an ad and I would just, okay, let me go. And then I would go and then something else would open up and somebody would invite me somewhere and, my head would be saying, no, 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 no. But my heart was saying, go. Just yeah. say yes. And then I'd say yes, and something else would happen. And some, and it just, my, I feel like the last um, eight years of my life, especially in this, these past eight, nine years in India, has only been, has been a lot of flow. Not yeah. only flow, but a lot of beautiful flow. And I, I think that, that dark time where literally I felt like everything was gone yeah. that I had strived for that needed to happen for this new space to open up. And yeah, and you know, you were talking about how sometimes your students are like thinking about what should I do, what should I do? And there's this, you know, strong, there is a sense of wanting to control your your destiny and being like, no, I need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And there's a striving mm -hmm. there, right? And what I hear from your story is that there was a striving and controlling of where you're going. And then it's when you started to let go and started to like listen to yourself and respond from your heart like, yeah, I want to do this. And it sounds crazy, but I'm going to go to the Himalayas and you know, wear these robes. And, you know, that's when magic started happening. Yeah. You couldn't have said it better. Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I always tell the students, so, you know, they're a part of this program is how, you know, Especially the ones who are really sincere, the ones who are really, you could just see, they have all the raw abilities. They're, yeah. they're smart, they're good people, they're, you know, they're, they're, they, they're going to do a great job wherever they're they like end. wanting to yeah, hold on want. and like, you know, let me control this and I, I need to, because people see them achieve. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've, I see myself in that because it's like, you know, people see potential in you mm -hmm. and you almost want to do them right. Yeah. You know, you almost want to be like, yeah, I know I have potential, so I must achieve and I must find the best job and it's like no there's a part that needs to let go of like that like not striving to achieve necessarily mm -hmm. but just go with what feels right like allowing your interest to draw you and yeah, it's one of the hardest things to, to first I, I tell so many people that and then I know when they're on the other side like, what is this guy talking about and I, I typically I just had this conversation yesterday the last thing I did with one of my colleagues actually is when you're making these decisions about your future, just try yeah. your best to engage in something that's more heart oriented. Yeah. Because he's the person I was speaking to. It's an incredibly smart and sincere person, and I I could actually feel the thought bubbles jumping out and running yeah. around his head and running around everywhere. And I was like, okay, when you're thinking about what to do next in your life, just please spend some time playing football or meditating or reading or art, doing some art. Do something that allows you to get out of your head and into your heart and then yeah. start to figure out where you want to go next. And yeah. um, it sounds like very um, random advice to give, especially if you're not from this space. But yeah. I found that in my life, it's the most, um, I guess, the most effective way of planning my future is when I'm fully in my heart space and not in my head space. Yeah. How do you see the, you know, the the younger part of you that was striving, achieving, like, does it still have an impact on you today? Like, how does it now today when you are doing something more from your heart and, you know, you're flowing more and you, you are more spiritual and focused on your development, mm -hmm. how do you see that part of you show up today? I check in with my, myself on this quite a bit. And I, mm -hmm. I, I would love to sit here and tell you that, oh, yeah, 
I'm, I'm great now. Yeah. I'm totally, I'm always blissful. <laughs> I'm so happy. It's my little boy who is completely yeah. running away from being Indian is totally cool now. Yeah. He's fine the way he is. He's fine however people think of <laughs> I would love to say that. I can't say that. I am still striving way too much. Um, I'm striving way too much with awareness, which is the best thing. Um, I also have a partner that grounds me. She yep. is amazing and she helps me see she loved me for the per- she met we met at a festival so she did not know Neil Shaw director of a professional football league or program director of a sports management program she knew Neil Shaw the guy who's jumping around like a monkey yeah. dancing at this dance festival having the time of his life flirtatious at times happy yeah. go lucky at times really deep and introspective at times she's met that person and she fell in love with that person and that's the person i know deep down who i really am yeah. And that's the person that I know I, when I'm achieving the most success in my life is when I'm embodying that individual. Now, um, there's still a side of me that's really driven to achieve, succeed, uh, be seen as somebody who's somebody in, yeah. the, in the world and making yeah. a difference. And I think that, that part is also quite natural. It, yeah. it, it's also I've been, part of you. Yeah, I've been given these gifts and whatever, been wired in a particular way by the universe, by God, by whatever, but to... To, to go out there and achieve certain things. And yeah. there's a part that feels that at some point my priorities will shift fully into a space where I can spend more time in, in, in meditation, writing, mm. teaching, and less on the kind of revenue generation side of our business. Yeah. Um, and it's already happening um, given the, how the last year and a half and two years have been. But so my, 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 Key is that even while I'm still in this driven stage, my, my I guess my objective right now for myself or whatever, my what I'm striving for or not striving for is figuring out a way to to be in celebration, be in playfulness, to mm-hmm. calm down, to slow down, and spend, it, it, even while achieving on this revenue generation, building creation yeah. stage. And I think that's where my struggle still is, is finding a way to kind of shut this off for a bit and just be here and, and relax and enjoy and realize that it, it's, it's okay. It's okay yeah. if I don't, um, if I don't make crores and crores for, for every business that I'm in. It's okay if this, this doesn't, if everything doesn't work out exactly how I want it to work out. It's okay. And um, although everyone will tell me that it's okay, somewhere that my mind is so crazy that I just can't stop. You yeah. know? I think that's that's my key. It's, it's like that, to... you know, that young voice of like, this isn't good, en- this isn't enough. Yeah. More, more, more. Let's do more, and that's still active somewhere. And and then I hear this other side of you that's longing for slowing down and longing for celebration, and and that is the biggest challenge, right? How do you, um, like, for for myself, for example, I I left the you know work oriented like task like go 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 like let's let's do everything and let's be this achiever Mm -hmm. and i sort of like disown that a bit to become this more being oriented flowing oriented person but the struggle is like i want to be both i i i want i want to be able to tap into my gifts and like do stuff Mm -hmm. and and achieve yeah but, but not lose and i'm so afraid of losing my groundedness i'm so afraid of losing my uh my my slowness inside and how do you how how do you cope with that on a day-to-day basis i try to meditate um, yeah. not as much as I, I and i know it's probably the most powerful tool that has been taught to me um and and that i could at least use in my life to ground myself and to be yeah. connect with more people connect with myself and to really enjoy enjoy this beautiful life and yet i don't do it as much as i can but i mm-hmm. um, at least couple times a week my wife and I will go to some meditation circles yeah. or I'll take some time out in the morning we you know we practice yoga in the mornings at uh, with a great yeah. teacher so that helps um I try to use inside timer when I'm in the ola or uber <laughs> to to calm down that way or just catch my breath every once in a while or read spiritual texts now um I honestly I don't know how I think I have to make it more of a priority, and yeah. if I don't, I'm gonna burn out. Um, yeah. And before, um, and I, so I'll have an uh, abrupt halt to yeah. this versus a, a more natural transition Absolutely. into where I want to go. But I totally get what you're talking about. I mean, I think you're somebody who I admire because you've been able to immerse yourself into your your own growth and development. You've yeah. been able to figure out 
how to start making something you're truly, truly passionate about, which is, you know, self-discovery and others into turning it into a profession and helping other people along the way and, and living life by your own, um, you know, your own rhythm and your own yeah. pace yeah. Right, versus having some corporate or some bosses or some yeah. sort of clients tell you exactly how you need to schedule your life and time to make sure that they're, they're being um, accommodated. So I'm very, um, not even envious, but I'm very. Uh, but yet, uh, there's constant with that. judgment. You yeah. know, there's so constant side, yeah. judgment. Like there's constant. You know, when people ask me what I do, you know, <laughs> I, it's it's because I'm allowing myself slowness. Like I, I told myself earlier this year, I'm gonna live more slowly. It's okay for me to not achieve. Um, I may not be in the state always, but I want to allow it. I mm -hmm. wanna I wanna say that my worth is not dependent on. Oh, I'm you know. I don't need to speak fancy, yeah. you know, and I don't need to impress people. Mm -hmm. And and but then to deal with people not being impressed and being a little disappointed, <laughs> being like that's what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> like but the you know, that we knew. Was, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is, is though, you know, and it's 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 always the grass is always greener because I yeah. found now that the when so I work so hard to develop this great story. Now I have this amazing story that I can. Say that I've worked in professional yeah, sports yeah. league, and then I've come to India, and then I've done blah, 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 and I've created this sports management program, and I travel the world representing Indian sports, and blah, blah, blah. And I've done this story on TEDx Talks. I've done this story. I do this story probably every day in some different form. And yeah. I found that, um, yes, while people are interested in, in hearing that, or they seem interested, or they yeah. act like they're interested, or it's yeah. fun to talk about, and it's a conversation started at a party or whatever else, my most saddest moments actually socially now is when I walk into a space of people who are actually it's slow Slowing grounded down, yeah. and they're just at peace within themselves yeah. and I I walk in with all of this story and, yeah. and, and anxiety and, and energy and this yeah. and I'm not and they're not able to connect and I can actually connect feel that right. connect is not happening yeah and I would rather connect with those individuals a hundred times over and not bring in all this crazy yeah. wild energy into a, a room that is so beautifully grounded and connected yeah. at, and at peace. And that's actually embarrassing to me. So I think I've told the story a thousand times that I've understood that, you know what, at some point I, I need to let the story go yeah. and I need to give it up and just set it aside and said, you've served me for however long you've Absolutely. served me. And as many times as I've promised my wife and myself that I'm just going to walk into new gatherings and new places and, and just, not tell this same not story. Not tell this story, yeah. I, I find myself telling that story. And I think that's yeah. one of the reasons I'm so attracted to retreats yeah. and other places where quickly you realize they don't give a crap about your story. They yeah. don't want to know your story. They want to know you. Yeah. And the more you They want you, you to be honest in the moment. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm striving to not – actually, i got to stop using that word striving. I am – Building, developing myself in my capacity to just be okay with not being my story. And yeah. I know that's so much of what you're doing here with this talk and yeah. the kind of, you know, ways that you're helping people just be authentic, be their authentic selves versus yeah. their story. And it's it's great what you're doing. And, I, and so many of us who feel like we've become who we are because of our story, it's, we cannot be... Uh, tied down by this so story. well if you're not this story yeah. right who are you like how would you like to what parts of you do you want to own and say this is this is me i uh, whenever i think whenever i think what, what what comes to me is just playful yes playful yes. Uh, giggly goofy yep. the word monkey comes up in terms of just <laughs> jumping around and sometimes spontaneous yes and, you know um like slightly on edge at times, but in a great way because people don't know what's going to come next. And they're like, <laughs> right. man, is he going to just like take us to the airport and buy tickets to Not go Not like on? this driven, like, you know, yeah, achieving. Yeah, uh, driven, achieving almost too much pride and too much ego with what I've done and what I've accomplished. And I, 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 but more like I can walk into a space and make it so light and playful and fun and goofy and flirtatious and charming and everything all at once. And I, yeah. I know that's the person that's so much here. And um, unfortunately, that boy doesn't get to play very often when I'm so busy, you know, doing or so seemingly busy doing things. But what's what's here is that person. Mm, you know, the playful, the boy. The, yeah. yeah. And Krishna comes in. Yeah. And I, you know, the God, the one of the, you know, Sri Krishna is somebody I resonate so much with. And not, not just the one who's 
speaking to Arjuna and, and, and with so much wisdom. But the, little, but the one the yeah, little boy yeah. <laughs> who's dancing and, and goofy and who's yep. creating so much love and connection and intimacy. And that in, is at the space. essence of who you are. And, I feel so. I like absolutely. to think so. I don't know, but I, I like to think so. Yeah. Do you feel like, uh, like in just interacting with you, like do you feel like self judgment comes in the way too, though? Like, All the time. You know, because even I, I've, I've heard you judge yourself and being like, you better not be inauthentic and yeah. you better not be, you know, and I hear that voice and I, I see it in myself too. It's the constant desire to be something, but then the constant judgment that I'm not being that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. All and the it's time. like, how am I going to be playful? If <laughs> You know, my, my, my intention for these interviews too is to be in my playful self. But before them, I'm like, I better ask like the right questions and I, you know, and like, and, and so I feel like that does, do you? All the time. Struggle with all that? The time, all the time. Self, self-judgment is one of my 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 biggest hindrances to actually being playful or Absolutely. actually even just connecting with people. Absolutely. I mean, while this interview is going on, of course, You're my thinking, mind, like, you know? <laughs> I think I've said, uh, you know, and I've said, uh, I've said, you know, strive. I could tell you all the words. I heard that. You were judging yourself for saying strive. Yeah, yeah. I'm judging myself while, you know, attempting to be playful and attempting to be authentic <laughs> it's just it's crazy yeah. how like it would take so many days of just being in meditation being in playful environments connecting from heart space to be able to do this interview truly yeah uh, from a space where literally words are just flowing for me where everything yeah. i'm creating you're not thinking out, it's about just, it it's, it's brand new yeah and it's unfolding in a way that's that's never unfolded before even now, there's a lot of stories that have been created. That there's a script that what I'm telling you, but it's it's so much of my my. But my maybe that's a lot to that ask of yourself, right? Like <laughs> I when know. I hear you ask of yourself to create brand new content, I'm like, Neil, <laughs> yeah. that's a lot to ask of yourself. No, like, but it all feels like art it be is possible. created from influences, and you know, creating original stuff mm-hmm. is kind of a myth sometimes, and like you're yes. going to be processing stuff that comes up. Yeah. It is all true, yes. <laughs> what you're saying is true, and I should not judge if I'm sharing a story that I told in the past before or whatever else it might be. And it is coming from a brand new place from this moment, in, this moment, in, 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 yeah. in the context that I'm telling telling the story. So, Absolutely. And there's something new that I'm getting and hearing myself say this story. Absolutely. So I, uh, yeah, I think that self judgment is uh, something that is a huge you know, thing. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, when you look forward, we've talked about your story. Um, when you look forward from this point on, what is the gift you want to give yourself? How do you want to live or, you know, mm-hmm. what do you want to focus on? I want to focus on other people. Mm-hmm. I think the gift I want to give myself is listening. Mm-hmm. I, um, the gift I want to give myself is is being so much in other people's worlds. Being able to first mm-hmm. be so grounded in my own self and being so accepting in my own self through practices and through mm. you know, spiritual reading and other things that I can actually be in somebody else's world in the way in a way that you're with me right now or yeah. and that a lot of the best guides and mentors or friends or just people are yeah. with other people when I'm able to be in other somebody else's world fully and actually be curious and yeah. interested in other people's worlds actually I would be at peace here because I no longer need to pay attention to what they think of me because it doesn't matter anymore because yeah it doesn't it's matter not anymore. on you it's it? not on me I can, and at the same time i want to respect myself to make sure that i'm doing Absolutely. everything that i i need to do to take care of myself take care of my spiritual self my mental self my emotional self mm. my physical self so do whatever i need to do in my own time so yes have it be part of my my day-to-day routine yes at the same time when i'm with people because I feel like it's, yeah. I'm always okay or typically okay when I'm, now when I'm on my own. Because I, yeah. I, I know I can pick up a book and read and I'll yeah. feel good. I know I can write and I'll feel good. I know I can meditate and I'll feel good. But the second you get me out into the world where other people are judging me and I'm judging myself. You're so aware about them, of those judgments. Aware. and yeah. yeah. I mean, it reminds me of you going into those meditative circles and when you said you're not connecting mm-hmm. and that you you were coming from a space of this is me, my energy, my, and it's like the minute you focus on others, mm-hmm. the me is dropped, right? Like you're able to just listen and that's how you connect. Absolutely. But when you're grounded in your own story and your own, like, you know, this is who I am, then there's less connection there. Completely. Yeah. And you, you walk away from 
social interactions without feeling completely at ease. Absolutely. Even if, even if say I walk into a room with you know ten people and say six or seven of them are like, "Wow, you're amazing! You're really doing something cool." And yeah. you know, but if say three of them are just kind of like, "Meh," or I don't get a good read from them, I would walk away thinking about those three mm-hmm. people and what I did or didn't do right to to win them over. And it's yeah. it's crazy that game never ends because you that know that's the fanboy ends. game. Yeah. That's the people who connect with you out of fandom. Yeah. Right? And who look at your achievements and connect with that versus people who connect with you in in your present being. And that's what what happens when you listen, when you give them a sense of attention. So I loved what you said because you said, I want to take care of myself Mm -hmm. and focus on self-care. And then like it's self-care plus focusing on others. Mm -hmm. When I'm with people... The attention is not on me, it's on them. Completely. And it's, you know, there's this term I love that came up in one of my communication courses a long time ago. It's um, dancing in the conversation. Mm. And and you can dance in the conversation when you're just, yeah, you fully let go of any agenda. When you fully let go of, I need to win Mega over. I need to win, I need to make sure, or I need to make sure she she says yes to this, this, and this, I'm going to ask of her. Nothing like that. I just want um, with people in the world now. I've, I've I've done whatever I needed to do in terms of my professional life. I just want to dance in the conversation. Absolutely. I want to dance anyway in life, but I was. I want to dance him. all the time. Yeah, but, but yeah, exactly. So dancing in in the streets, dancing in, in the beach, <laughs> dancing on the whatever. But at the same time, um, if I'm if I'm actually using words yeah. with people, then I want to be able to just dance in that conversation yeah. and let it flow. When you walk away, when you actually walk away feeling like a piece of them. So much is joy. With you. Yeah, I yeah. feel like so much because joy. Because dancing about is about listening and responding. Yeah. You know, and, and about playing. Yeah. It's like I do a move and you respond with that move and then you try something. And, you know, it's, it's such a connected thing to do. So it's yeah. a really, yeah, it's such a beautiful, um, yeah, it's such a beautiful exchange. And and we 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 have that opportunity every single day with Absolutely, anybody. It could be yeah. with the first, like my lift man, or it could be with, you know, any of my students could be with anybody, my mother, my father, my brother. Yeah. Every day we're given that opportunity multiple times with the Ola driver or the Uber driver to dance in the conversation mm-hmm. instead of just transact with the conversation. And I've, I've, I've worked on it, but I know that the more I work on myself, the better chance I'm going to have to have that with people. Well, it's been such a pleasure <laughs> dancing with you in this conversation. It's been really lovely just to even discover my dancing ability to dance and and seeing you show up so thank you so much for being here no oh, thank you <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I walked into uh you know, before i sat on this couch with a whole lot of madness <laughs> and it's incredible in you know this space of where i was and probably when we look back at this interview kind of the madness of my mind coming in and how you know the last even 10 minutes or 15 minutes of conversation i'm actually feeling my experience of myself is very different and that's thanks to your You're listening. You're being you. Thanks to, <laughs> yeah, thanks to your just, just being able to talk about things that I haven't spoken about in a long time or thought about in a long time and, and being it with a really um, committed listener like yourself. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you me. so much.